business news where news for business people. Thanks for tuning in to Bloomberg Quint. My name is Neeraj Shah and you're watching Alpha Moguls. Our guest today, very special guest, all the way from the US, needs no introduction, Monish Pabrai. And boy, Monish, how I've been looking forward to doing this show with you. Uh, a bunch of people who knew that you were on the show have already sent me a list of questions. So I have a bunch of questions ready for you. But thanks for joining in today. Well, Neeraj, I always love hanging out with you. I think uh, it's great to have you uh, as one of the key folks at Bloom Bloomberg Quint. Thank you. And I wish Bloomberg Quint all the best in the future. Hey, thanks so much, Monish, for that. Uh, uh, the question mark also is that do you, all of us wish investors all the best in the future as well. And I want to start off with two things that we discussed that we should talk about. And very curiously, Monish, on a show which is meant to educate investors, you are starting off, or we are starting off, by telling them that, hey, don't go out and buy stocks. <laughs> That's or don't right. go out and buy a stock. Now, let's elaborate on that. Why did you want to talk about well, that? Well, you know, because uh, the... The, uh, the Surgeon General said buying stocks can be injurious to your health. <laughs> uh, but but uh, on a more serious note, well, uh, so uh, buying, buying a stock uh, is, is a far more complicated activity than most people seem to think. So what's happened with the development of markets is on a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop, we can in seconds buy one of thousands of companies. And uh, there's no effort required to buy a stock, no effort required to sell a stock. But uh, in order to do well, one really needs to understand the underlying business and to have a point of view on kind of where that is versus the, the market capitalization. So I'll give you an example. Uh, many times in the US, like I'll go to my health club, for example, and one of the members will ask me, hey, Monish, uh, should I buy Apple? Should I buy Apple stock? And I turn the question around to them. I say, uh, hey, John, what's the market cap of Apple? And they look at me with a puzzled look. They said, the stock is at 170. I said, no, no, what is the market capitalization? And they don't know. OK, so the first thing, if you're going to buy, if you're going to go buy some rice in the market, you're going to know what is the price per kilogram. So the first thing is that if you're going to buy a stock, at least know what you can buy the whole company for. And most investors don't have that knowledge, which is amazing. And so the first, the first thing an investor ought to ask themselves before they buy a stock, uh, even before we get to price and so on, is, is this within my circle of competence? Now, circle of competence is a very important concept, one of the most important concepts in investing. A person like Warren Buffett, would consider something like 95% of stocks outside his circle of competence. And uh, he says that you know probably 97, 98% of things that show up on his desk go into a box called the too hard pile. He can't figure them out. Okay, so there's just a sliver of businesses. Now, if Warren Buffett can't figure out 95% of businesses, for the rest of us humans, we can't figure out 99% of them. So most things are going to be outside the circle of competence of most investors. So now let's say an investor answers the question correctly. Yes, I understand Apple, and I understand it's within my circle of competence, right? So the next question then comes up is the question I asked, what could you buy the whole company for? And then the second question an investor should ask is, so let's say an investor knows Apple is worth a trillion dollars, for example. So the question I would ask them is that if your family had a fortune of four trillion, would you be willing to put one fourth of that fortune into Apple? And if the answer is yes, buy the stock. If the answer is no, don't buy a single share. And so these are just very simple, which is, you know, look at your net worth, look at your family's fortune, and are you willing to put a quarter of it buying the whole company that you want to buy 100 shares of? And so these are basic things that most investors, unfortunately, uh, don't focus on. Uh, 
Yeah. And so I feel that uh, investing in stocks, figuring out you know, what they're worth, uh, what your circle of competence is, these are complicated issues. So for most investors, it's a really good idea to index. Uh, because indexing, you can buy a Nifty 50 index or any broad index in India uh, for basis points. You know, the, the frictional cost for ETFs and all is very low. And, and the second is you average out over time. So every month when you get your, uh, your salary check, take a small portion, first put it into savings, mm. and then don't worry about it. Uh, well, what I would say, set it and forget it. Mm. Fill it, shut it, forget it. The yeah, yeah. Hero Honda. yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so that's why I think that buying stocks uh, should really be an exception rather than the norm. Okay. Uh, the second topic, uh, and before we move on to the more nuanced investor, a sure. second thing that I wanted to talk to you about, again, we discussed this on, on email, about this whole notion of stop loss that you f that you find amusing in India. Yes. Because apparently in the US, nobody deals with the concept of stop loss. Now, let me tell you a peculiarity <laughs> here, Monish, uh, because we do this day in, day out for a living. A lot of technical experts who come in give stop losses. They are mandated too as well, because sure. it's a trading yes, day that yes. they have. They don't care about the fundamentals. They are only bothered about the charts. Right. Uh, you would still believe that the notion of a stop loss from a serious investor's perspective should be done away with. We don't find too many people talk about stop losses if they are serious investors, but you believe that there is enough and more talk yes. about stop loss happening on fundamental investing as well. That's right. So, in so just to clarify, sure. uh, we're not talking about the speculators and traders. Sure. So uh, more power to them. More power. Uh, uh, but, but when we come to investors, uh, I, I actually find plenty of pundits on, on, uh, on TV who uh, have done fundamental analysis and they give targets and they give stop losses. And, uh, and I find that really peculiar. So uh, the, the nature of markets, so one of the reasons why we can make a lot of money in equity markets is because they're auction driven. And auction driven markets are very different from almost any other kind of market. So to give you an illustration, let's say I bought a flat in Mumbai for one crore. I don't know if we can get one for one crore <laughs> or not, but let's, let's play along. Uh, we got one maybe in the, in the periphery of Mumbai. Okay, so we yes. paid a crore for the, for the flat and we did research and we found that it's the right price and we bought it. And uh, now we want to know how the price of that flat changes every day. So I have a friend who's a real estate broker and I tell my friend, the real estate broker, listen, we're going to have chai with Pabrai every day. You and I are going to have a cup of tea. And every day, just come and tell me what the price, market price of my flat is. OK, so you bought the flat. Next day, you invite your broker friend. And he says, so I ask him, so what's the price of my flat? He'll say, uh, listen, idiot, it's still one crore. OK, I call him after two days. He still says, still one crore. And after maybe two months, he says, you know, uh, the, the little change in transactions, it's actually 1.05 crores now it's 1.005 crores, it's gone up a little bit. And if you did this every day, and you just wrote down the price he was giving you, and did it for 365 days, you would, at the extreme end, find that it went to somewhere between 95 lakhs and maybe 1.1 crores or 1.15 crores, in that range, right? Now, let's say my flat is a listed company on the Bombay Stock Exchange, but the only asset is this flat. And every day the price is doing whatever it's doing in the market. And we chart that daily price movement. What we're going to find is in a 52 week period, the range may be something like between 70 lakhs and 1.3 crores. And the reason is that auction driven markets undershoot and overshoot. And it is the undershooting and overshooting that creates the opportunity for people like me. Right? And so, uh, so basically, uh, the idea of a stop loss would be like I bought the flat for a crore mm. and uh, after six months my broker tells me, you know, prices have dropped about 5%. Mm. And I say to him, okay, that's my stop loss and I'm now going to sell you my flat for 95 lakhs. Please sell it, right? It would be the equivalent of doing that. The reason you bought the flat for a crore because you thought that was fairly priced and the second reason you bought it because you wanted to hold it as a long-term asset. So the same thing with stocks. If you bought a stock for 200 rupees, or it has a market cap of 1,000 crores, you bought it because you thought it's worth 2,000 crores. 
So if it goes from 1,000 crores to 900 crores, you will, you will sell it with stop losses, and it makes no sense. So I own a company called Rain Industries, right? And I, I bought that stock about, about two and a half years ago. Hmm. And when I was buying the stock, it was at about 30 rupees a share. And by the time I finished buying, it got up to 45 rupees a share. It went up almost 50% because I almost bought 10% of the business. And after I finished buying, it proceeded to go down. Just like everything I buy, <laughs> okay? The stock knows I bought it and it decides, Monish is done, now let's go down, okay? If I had engaged in stop losses, uh, rain went down to 40, even went down to 35 after I finished buying, mm -hmm. and I did nothing. And so now rain is north of, I don't know, 360 rupees. And so that whole opportunity would have been gone. It would have been no sense for me to put a stop loss at 30 or 35 or 40 because I thought it was worth a lot more. So I think, I think investors ought to focus on making sure that, that the stock is within the circle of competence, that it's worth a lot more than it's valued at. And when, once you have those two things, a stop loss makes no sense. Wow. So, circle of competence. I think that's that's the preliminary. The most important thing. Yes, three the three most magical words from Ben Graham. Okay, great. Now, if if circle of competence was were the three most magical words from Ben Graham, I think one of the most amazing things that I've seen you speak about a lot. I've also saved that image. I can't find it right now, but you'd remember I sent that image to you, which said something like. Uh, most of the times when I'm looking for an idea, I need the idea to scream at me saying, buy me. Until then, I don't yeah. go out in and the, buy. In the, in the U.S., you know, we have these uh, wooden uh, things called two-by-fours, okay. which we use in, in housing construction. I need to be hit on the head <laughs> by a two-by-four before right. I should buy a stock. Yeah. So before buying a stock, it has to be complete and total no-brainer. Okay. Uh, if, if I have to turn on Excel, it's automatic rejection. If I cannot describe the idea to a seven-year-old in two or three minutes, it's automatic rejection. It needs to be painfully obvious, painfully obvious to the village idiot why we should be buying. Where are such opportunities currently in such an overheated market? And I, I okay, let me rephrase. I'm not using the term overheated loosely. I'm just saying the markets have rallied. We may not be in bubble territory for certain markets and all of that is a subject of everybody's individual right. opinion. Only future will show whether we were there or no. But let's assume for a moment's sake we are not in bubble territory, but we are in a, in a space where the markets are at worst, fairly valued. You will probably not get opportunities wherein you get hit by a two by four. Well, you? you know, we are in wonderful low upper rail right now. And within, I would say, 10 or 15 kilometers of the lower upper rail, from here to the next 15 kilometers, is a boatload of opportunities in okay. real estate. Okay, fine. I didn't want to get down to real estate sure, so soon. Sure. We'll, we'll get to that. But you, even right now, what I'm trying to find out, Monish, is that you are still in a market like this looking for ideas which are just too painfully obvious. You're not well, going I think, I think I think even in, uh, in rampant bull markets, uh, there are always misunderstood businesses. Now, rampant bull markets will cause a lot of overpricing, and I think a lot of things are overvalued. But it, there are plenty of things that may be fairly or deeply undervalued. In, in a market like India, with 5,000 listed companies, more than 5,000 listed companies, it is just not possible in auction-driven markets that all of them are efficiently priced. Sure. We are going to have underpricing and we're going to have overpricing. Just the nature of the beast. Okay. Uh, the reason why I ask this question is a lot of uh, your peers, a lot yes. of people uh, within the same uh, space. We did a small series with Ramdev Agrawal sometime back in Wonderful Bali. guy, good friend. Yeah, okay. So, and Ramdev says often that I find value in growth. Mm -hmm. So the stock may not be underpriced on may not be a screaming buy but if there is growth that he sees over the period of four four five six ten years maybe more sure. and there are other factors attached to this by the way viewers not just growth itself in itself then that becomes an opportunity too are you looking for such opportunities in India because India is per se a growth market you are definitely better off buying a growing company over a cheap no growth company. Okay. So if I buy an asset that is cheap, that has very limited growth, 
all I'm going to do is cover the gap between, it may be worth uh, 100 rupees a share, I'm getting it for 50, 60 rupees a share. I'm just going to make the 40 or 50 rupees over whatever period of time it takes to get there. Now, if I'm buying a company that has secular tailwinds, great management and long growth engines, as long as I'm not paying up too much, it's the best place to be. Okay. And so I think, I think Ramdev, in my opinion, is one of the best investors in the country. And I think, uh, well, the only, only, I would say, critique I would have around Dave is a tad too optimistic at times. But he's got it absolutely right that you bet on the growth engines and you bet on the long-term secular growth engines, which have got a lot of tailwinds. And, uh, and those, in general, uh, are going to do really well. So, uh, so I, think, I think they've got it... Uh, Sure. They've got mostly. They've got it mostly right. Okay. Now the reason why I asked you this question is very recently in one of the interviews or interactions or quotes that you gave out, you mentioned that uh, uh, you know it might be really important to buy in compounders uh, from a long-term perspective. And there are some questions that I've gotten with regards to that as well. Somebody mm -hmm. is asking, and I have a question of my own as well, sure. as to how does Monish decide if a compounder, compounder is egregiously priced and has reached the tipping point of selling versus your earlier stance of selling at about 90 to 95% of the perceived fair value. How do you decide this? How do you decide that a compounder has reached a value which is overpriced and therefore you would want to get out of it? Okay, so uh, let's uh, unpack the question a little bit. Sure. So we've got two types of things we've got to do with companies, right? So we're the points at which we buy them and why we buy them and the points at which we sell them and why we sell them. Sure. Um, buying is complicated. Selling is 10 times more complicated. Okay, so, so when we're trying to buy, relative to selling, it's relatively straightforward. We want to know what the growth engines are if we're going after a growth company. We want to know what we're paying for that growth. And we want to try to figure out where is this company in five years or 10 years versus what we're paying for it. Uh, and so those are relatively straightforward uh, compared to the selling question. Uh, the selling question uh, is a more complicated question. Uh, because one of the things uh, we are forced to do is we're forced to look out into the future, uh, maybe a few years out, to try to figure out what is the future of this business. Mm. And for most companies, even the insiders have a very fuzzy idea about the future. And so, so the thing is that if we buy a compounder at uh, a value price, that's a relatively easy exercise because we're, we're not paying up. But the difficulty comes in when it goes up in price and it looks fully priced, but still has a lot of tailwinds and still has great management, still has a lot of great growth in front of it. So the best that I've been able to answer the question is a great company with great growth, with great management, uh, give them some leeway. So don't sell them when they're fully priced. Don't sell them when they're overpriced. Sell them when they're egregiously priced. Okay. Now, what each of these levels are, I'll leave to the viewer, but it yeah. should be obvious. You know, when is it fully priced, when is it overpriced, when is it egregious? So what I've learned, what one of my biggest mistakes has been is selling too early. I have watched 100 baggers that I bought who went on to become 100 baggers so many times after I was out. Mm. And I'd only captured the double or the triple, and I didn't capture the remaining 98 or 97 times that it went up. But when you buy, you don't know it's going to be a 100 bagger. Absolutely. In fact, you learn, you learn about a business only after you own it. So you may do all the analysis in the world, but you're really going to learn the business after you own it. And that still doesn't mean, viewers, that you don't try and learn about the business before you buy it. <laughs> it should be in your circle of competence <laughs> before you go out and buy it. Okay, let's try and relate a couple of real life examples, if you will. Sure. And if you allow me, um, we can completely avoid this question as well. Sure. And I'll come to real estate because I want to know if you use a lot of questions on that too. But let's take the classic case of Rain Industries. Now, you've bought it way earlier. This is not a recommendation from Monish Pabrai by any stretch of imagination. But I just want to know, it's an investment that has compounded well for you in a short period of time, but it's given you maybe 8x or 9x returns already. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been the compounder that you would probably seek. Most people would be happy with a 10-bagger, uh, a large 10-bagger. You've gotten one. How do you know that this is not the time 
to get out of it? Are you giving the leeway to the management or are you studying the cycle of the business so well enough that you believe that there is more in store? Okay, so first uh, disclaimer that uh, my views may change tomorrow. Of course. Right, so this is a dynamic thing and uh, they're valid at this point in time and it's the best that I can say at this point. So I think first of all, rain is interesting because uh, after I bought it, for 18 months, it did nothing. And then, uh, and, but this is the nature of equities, is they go through long periods of doing nothing and short periods when they do a lot. Mm. So if you, even if you study markets over long periods, in the US, for example, from 1965 to 1982, the index, the Dow, was flat. Uh, 878 to 878, 17-year period. And the US grew a lot in that period. Then from, uh, from uh, 80 to 90, 82 to 99, grew a lot. It went from 800 to like 12 or 13,000. So the equity markets have this habit of not being smooth, mm. right? And uh, so rain was an example, extreme example, because it sat doing nothing for 18 months and then you know, went wild and crazy, if you will. Uh, I had a certain understanding of the business before I made the investment. Uh, and most of that understanding was because someone sent me a very nice report on rain and it made it obvious. Uh, in fact, basically based on that report, uh, the price I was paying for the stock in 2015 was likely to be the earnings of the company in 2018 or 2019. So I was basically buying in 2015 at P of one in 2018 or 2019 and it was a profitable company. So. Anytime you can do that, you don't need to think about it too much. And uh, so I thought at the time before, before I bought Rain that probably in a five-year period, we might make somewhere between five and 10 times our investment. So it was a very obvious, no-brainer type investment. I tried to buy every share I could. Sure. And uh, in the last two and a half years, I've spent more time, obviously it's a long time, and I spent more time studying the business and trying to understand more about it. It's a complicated business. They've got three different divisions and all that. And I've gotten a, a reasonably better understanding than I used to. And what I've concluded is the moat of rain is a wider and deeper moat than I had originally anticipated in 2015. And, uh, and it has better management than I had uh, thought they had. So many things about the business are better than I originally anticipated. Now, uh, just about, uh, I think, four or five days ago, I was in Beijing, and uh, the, the skies were blue, clear blue skies, and a number of uh, rain's competitors are in China, and something like a third of them have been shut down yeah. by the Chinese government because they're very serious about pollution. Yeah. Rain got some extra tailwinds, which I had not anticipated uh, from, for example, the Chinese government action. So I had no idea about that in 2015. It got an extra tailwind because now uh, the US has changed, the tax rate has gone down dramatically. So a few more tailwinds have emerged for the business, which were not present okay. a few years ago. And I just told you, fairly priced, overpriced, egregiously priced. So. Uh, my take on rain is to give it a little more rain, if you will, yeah. and uh, and let it let it let it uh, let it uh, run a little bit, and uh, we'll see uh, uh, we we'll see where we end up. But I I think my sense is it's got some room to run. Yeah, okay, but this is remember again I started. But it's not, a, not stock, a It's not a stock tip. Yeah. I wouldn't be buying at present prices, yeah. but I'm just not willing to sell at present yeah, prices. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to know that buy and sell. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I would not making. recommend yeah. rain as a screaming buy at this point. Perfect. Yeah, and we're not looking for that either, yeah. Monish. What I'm looking though for is the rationale, and let's not let's consciously avoid the stock names here in real estate. Yeah, sure. But let's look for the rationale that sure. you have, or that you had when you bought real estate and your rationale right now. Again, I'm just trying to figure out how is it that you're trying to find those mispriced opportunities? Absolutely, so you know, uh, Charlie Munger talks about uh, lattice work of mental models. And the lattice work of mental models is that when you have uh, multiple models moving in the same direction, uh, you tend to get where lula Plaza effects, Munger's lingo, lingo, one plus one becomes 11. And uh, so specifically with uh, 
uh, with real estate, uh, I learned a lot of things about real estate from Bruce Flatt, who's uh, the CEO of Brookfield Asset Management. And hmm. I think probably around 11 or 12 years ago, he had given a talk at Syracuse University. And uh, since then, unfortunately, I think they've taken it down. But he's got some interviews on Bloomberg. So I think you can, you can pull up some interviews with, with Bruce. And uh, Bruce uh, has created tremendous value at Brookfield, probably the tens of billions, if not uh, close to 100 billion in his two decades or so that he's been running Brookfield. So one of the things that Bruce Flatt and Brookfield believe is as far as real estate goes, they want to buy the absolutely best, most trophy properties in the 24-hour nonstop major cities of the world. Mm. Uh, they don't want to buy the second best tower. They want to buy the best tower. But they want to buy it at a time when no one's interested. And, and so they want the best assets, but at a time when no one's interested. So uh, most of the world, across the world, real estate's overheated. I just heard that a 60-square-foot apartment in, in Hong Kong went for half a million dollars. Okay, I can't even imagine what 60 square feet apartment looks like, but <laughs> but that's the pricing in Hong Kong. Probably the a most bathroom. probably the most expensive uh, market in the world. Um, while this is happening, uh, a recent interview of Bruce Flatt, he mentioned that uh, three countries were of specific interest to Brookfield: uh, Argentina, Brazil, and India. And they've been putting a lot of money in real estate in India and in Argentina and Brazil. But they, what they do is uh, they'll go into the epicenter of Rio or the epicenter of Buenos Aires, and they'll buy the best property. And today, there is a serious lack of capital in those, in those economies. So Brookfield basically takes capital into places where there's a lack of capital. And they've been doing that in Mumbai. And specifically in India, if, if you look at uh, the different cities, uh, Mumbai, in my opinion, is unique. So uh, places like Pune or Bangalore or Hyderabad or Delhi, these can sprawl out, uh, and they have sprawled out. And that is actually not good from a real estate perspective. What you want, you want scarcity, sure. you want tightness, and you, are, you, have, you want inability of anyone else to clone you. Uh, so if you put up a tower, no one should have the ability to put a tower up next to you because they just can't. There's no space or land or anything available. And the one city in India where that is possible, is uh, one of the only cities, is Mumbai. You know, we are wall-to-wall -wall people here. Yes. So there were three events that took place in the last about, let's say, 14 months or so, 13, 14 months. Uh, the first was demonetization. That was the first nuclear bomb that went off in the uh, Indian in, real estate yeah. industry. Uh -huh. uh, it sucked the oxygen out. Then we had GST. And then we had the trifecta with RERA. Rera. And before these three things, a few years back, they actually, especially in Mumbai, they standardized the rules for slum redevelopment and society redevelopment. So actually in Mumbai, actually, there's not just these three, but these two additional things that have happened. And the combo of these three has imploded the, the market across India, but specifically in Mumbai, more than the others. Mm. And the implosion is that real estate used to be a heavy uh, black ma money-driven sector, cash-driven sector. Uh, you know, we, we took out all the cash in one day. Yeah. And uh, so what are you going to do when, uh, you know, you're trying to get N crores of cash to close a transaction? Sure. Uh, you're done. And so uh, the entire real estate field in India is going through a reconfiguration. So a lot of the, I would say, uh, unscrupulous, unethical players... They fall by the wayside. They've already fallen by the wayside. They are struggling for oxygen right now. And they've been struggling, and so they're, uh, they're distressed. Uh, also, a lot of players had a lot of debt. They're distressed as well. And there's a small sliver of players who actually played by the rules, high quality players, great brands. And so they got some tailwind. So uh, the good guys are winning, which is great. I, I love it when the good guys are winning. And so, so uh, we, we had this kind of set of unique things going on in a place like Mumbai. So I remembered what Bruce Flatt said about these, if there's a 24-hour city in India, it is Mumbai. And for most Mumbaikers, there is no other city they can live in. Uh, <laughs> and so, so basically, 
we've got you. Yes. You know, you have to be here. And, and I'll, I'll take one more, one more uh, piece. So I would say that if you look at a place like Mumbai and you fast forward 50 years, so let's say we, again, are old and gray, still around in 2060 or 2070, we won't be, but let's say I, I probably won't be around, but mm -hmm. if we were having this conversation, almost every structure in Mumbai that was built more than 20 or 30 years ago is going to be torn down. This city is going to be completely rebuilt. We are actually seeing it, but it's too slow to see, but the entire city is going to be rebuilt. And when it gets rebuilt, about a dozen players will do about 70, 80% of the rebuilding. Because in real estate, brand matters. Because brands are trust. And in the biggest purchase you ever make in your life, trust becomes very important. So you need trust when you buy toothpaste, because you're gonna put it in a personal space like your mouth. But you need trust when you buy real estate. And, and so we have a combination of constrained supply, very valuable land, pathetic buildings, which deserve to be torn down. So the entire city is a teardown. And, and so, so I think that there's a, you know, in, in Ramdev terms, we probably have a 50-year runway. I was about to ask you that. You think this is a multi-year, multi-decade opportunity? This is, uh, I, I hope I'm smart enough to never sell any of the real estate holdings we have. Wow. That's, that's quite something, Monish. Uh, okay, so thanks for that information. These are, these are not uh, six-month bets. These are not six-month bets. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Monish, uh, let me ask you then. Uh, the, 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 the slate for investing, does it look conducive enough in 2018? I know individual bets will do well. Mm -hmm. They always do well irrespective of the market conditions. Right. But having enjoyed such a great market run in 2017, be it the U.S. markets, be it the other world markets, or India for that matter, are things still looking conducive for investing in 2018? You know, actually, I would say that I'm an anomaly. I'm an, I'm, I'm an investor in anomalies, right? So what we talked about in real estate was just anomalies anomaly. that took place. Rain was an anomaly, you know, sitting at PEO1 and all of these things. So the thing is that uh, when I look at the markets in India and uh, uh, so let's, let's focus on India first. So, but if I look at the, let's say, the 200 largest names in India, uh, I don't see screaming bargains. Uh, in fact, I, I see some very stretched valuations amongst those names. Very good companies, good tailwinds, and they may still become much more valuable in the future, but they're not obvious. And I focus on the obvious. So these are not no-brainers. These are not shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, they may be too uh, overpriced. They may take a stumble. So it's not an area that's of interest to me. Okay. Uh, and I think in India, the interesting thing is that there are lots of companies that are less than 500 crores, 700 crores market cap, underfollowed, under researched, uh, great entrepreneurs, great tailwinds. Uh, that that universe requires some digging, and some uh, some lifting to try to understand those businesses. There's also a lot of useless companies in that <laughs> in that cesspool, if you will. But in that cesspool, there are also 50 baggers of the future, 100 baggers of the future. So. Uh, my perspective is, I think of myself as a gentleman of leisure. I, I'd like to understand some of these businesses. I'm, just, I'm not assuming that I'm going to find something. But if we find something and suddenly seven moons line up, uh, we are happy to take a swing. <laughs> okay, my last question to you. Aside of uh, what we're seeing within the obvious pockets, and we've known about these, the rain industries and the real estate, are there other pockets of interest within India? People would want to know if there are themes or if there are sectors where you think uh, there is an opportunity where people can, where, where, where people, having studied uh, the businesses well enough, can invest into? Yeah, see, I think the, the biggest thing India has going for it is the growth engine, right? So if an economy is growing at six, seven, eight percent a year in that type of range, uh, a lot of companies uh, get natural tailwinds to grow at multiples of that. So. Ramdev would say if the economy grows at 7%, private banking will grow at 14%, for example. And so there are these multiplier type uh, opportunities. I mean, I, I'd say, I see that uh, let's take a, a asset class like asset management. Uh, I think asset management will grow at multiples of GDP growth. But uh, at least I haven't found obvious bargains. So it may well be that the growth engines are so strong in asset management that even if you're playing 30 times earnings, there may be 
a, a bargain, but a person like me has difficulty with those types of numbers, right? So I, I can see many, many areas in India which look great for the future. Uh, the issue is that the valuations don't make them obvious. And, and so uh, what, I'm looking, what I'm looking for is just be a general leisure, keep taking in the data, keep learning, and then once in a while you might find an anomaly. So I feel I was lucky in the last one year that real estate was an area that uh, you know turned out to be a good one. I am not sure at this point if in 2018 I'll find anything. At this point, I haven't come up with anything. You know, there's there's no buy list I have in India, uh, but but we'll keep looking. Yeah, we'll keep looking. Okay, let's end this with one final thought: uh, um, a really nice book or a really nice article or a video that you recently saw or read that uh, you found very interesting? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a few. So one is, uh, I think Ray Dalio uh, wrote a great book. I think that's worth reading. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, a great real estate investor, Sam Zell, uh, he wrote a book, uh, Am I Being Too Subtle? And Sam has had uncanny timing on entering and exiting uh, different sectors in real estate, done really well. And uh, it's a funny book. Uh, so I think that's, and in fact, uh, that book is available on Audible. It's available as an audio book, and it's in his voice. Uh, and the same thing with the Dalio book. I think the Dalio book's also available in, in Ray Dalio's voice. So if you're spending a lot of time in Mumbai traffic, uh, or in Delhi traffic, if you will, then, you know, put these, put these books in your car, and uh, it's a great way to, uh, to get knowledge while you're stuck in, stuck in traffic and such. Uh, so I think these these are uh, these are some recent uh, uh, decent books that I've I've really enjoyed. I can I squeeze in a question here, Monish? Have you looked at uh, the cryptocurrencies? Anything interests you out there? You know, the funny thing is, I have a I have a friend. Uh, he's been a friend of mine for like more than 20 years, and now he's been a venture capitalist. But he's now a venture capitalist who only invests in blockchain and these things. So he was coming. He lives in Chicago. He was coming to California, wanted to meet me. So I spent about two hours. Uh, with him downloading his brain on cryptocurrencies. And then after, as he was leaving, he said, you know, Monish, I wanted to get you acclimatized in this world, so I'm going to send you a Bitcoin. And uh, the next day, I received a whole Bitcoin from him. So I said, listen, I can't. It was about $4,000. I said, I can't take a $4,000 gift. No, 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 I got so much knowledge. You please keep it. Okay, so he wouldn't take it back. So I said, okay, my cost base is zero. I'll just hang on to this, right? Then I suddenly blinked my eyes and it's at 17,000. And so I said, okay, whatever was enough is enough. I, I put orders to sell it. And then recently, I haven't heard it, but I think uh, Charlie Munger did a talk uh, at uh, University of Michigan, and I heard he slammed the, the cryptocurrencies. I think so put me in the uh, Munger land or the land of the skeptics is uh, it's not an area where I'm looking for the next opportunity. Yeah, I want it like a plague. I think that's what Jack Vogel said, if I'm not wrong. That's right. But okay, great. Monish Pabrai, so good having you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us at Alpha Moguls, and have a great 2018. Hope you find the opportunity that you're looking for in India. Thank you, Neeraj. Always a pleasure. Right.